Hello everyone, my name is Kristen and I am a home baker from Chicago. In this video, I'll be taking you through my process to make an open crumb sourdough bread. This is one of my favorite recipes, a simple 20% whole grain wheat bread. I prefer higher hydration doughs for easy ingredient incorporation as I like to mix by hand, but I'll be giving all the ingredient amounts in grams during this video. We'll be following this flow chart, starting with the auto lease, then mixing in the remaining ingredients such as the leaven and sea salt, building up strength and structure in the dough during the bulk ferment, and finally we'll end with how to bake. I'll slice the still warm, crackly, crusted loaf at the end. You can also check out my Instagram page at Foolproof Baking. I have more recipes, tips, and methods posted. All right, let's begin with the auto lease. I do a pre-soak of the flour and water in order to jumpstart gluten development and increase dough extensibility, which can be great for maximizing open crumb in the final loaf of bread. After adding the water to the flour mix, I stir until there is no more dry flour remaining. I like to use this silicone spatula to mix. I scrape the sides of the bowl and pull the dough into the center of the mound, pressing down the dough as I go. Be sure you really get every last bit of flour hydrated, as it can be difficult to mix the dough later if you've got scrappy dry bits left over. At this point, the dough is looking about right. Just to show how different the dough can look before and after at Autolise, a quick demonstration. I've wet my hands here, and note that immediately after adding this water, the dough does not have any extensibility. The dough will simply tear apart. The gluten is just not ready yet. Let's leave this auto lease for about three hours while our leaven finishes activating. Now let's move on to adding the leaven. Let's check that window pane again. I wet my hands and gently pull a bit of the dough. And yep, this is looking good to me. I like to prepare my leaven in the morning. The key to a great sourdough bread is a great starter. I build mine at one to two to two and store it about 80 degrees Fahrenheit until it more than triples in volume. It takes about five hours. So go ahead and add your leaven right on top of the dough. You can wet your hand and spread the leaven across the top of the dough and then begin your hand mixing. Because the dough is so wet and extensible, the leaven doesn't take long to incorporate, maybe three or four minutes. This is good because the quick mixing steps prevent the dough from over oxidizing, which can damage your final crumb. At this point, the leaven appears to be incorporating well. I like to pull up a section of the dough and then fold the dough back on itself. You can really feel the strength and stretchiness of the dough when you do this. Nothing is tearing. It feels like a really nice dough. Once fully mixed, I like to clean up the dough ball by rounding the dough off in the bowl, creating a more taut surface. We'll go ahead and let this rest for about 30 minutes before adding the sea salt. It's now been 30 minutes since mixing the leaven. The dough is looking good. I like to use fine grain sea salt at a little more than 2%. I really like the flavor it gives to the final bread at this amount. I like to wet my hand and begin by dimpling in the sea salt. I then start folding the dough down and into itself, like this. Again, that high hydration of the dough is really working in your favor here. These ingredients are so easy to mix in. Addition of sea salt helps tighten the gluten structure and it can add strength to the dough while also slowing down the fermentation. This is also the last step that I find I can easily incorporate more water if necessary. If the dough is feeling overly tight to you, you can use this opportunity to splash on just a tiny bit of water, a little at a time, to increase the extensibility of the dough. Deciding to add more water is done in a large part based on the feel, and you'll develop a better sense of your ideal dough hydration based on experience over time. Now 
This stage of the mix took me about five minutes total. And the dough feels nice. I give it a little cleanup in the bowl and we'll let this rest for another 30 minutes. The next step in the method is performing a fold out on the counter. I like to do this midway between the incorporation of the sea salt and the lamination, which we'll discuss more in just a little bit. Always wetting your hand when handling the dough, I scrape the dough along the sides of the bowl and then flip the dough out onto a lightly misted surface. I add a bit of water to my bench scraper and then use the scraper to release the top of the dough from the counter. I pull gently but firmly from the top down, folding the dough onto itself, and then repeat the process around the dough on all four sides. This really gives you a good idea of how the dough is coming along at this early stage of the bulk fermentation. So you flip over, round the ball of dough up, and then return back to the same bowl. Cover and let rest for 30 minutes. Next up is lamination. This is a technique I learned from fellow Instagrammer, Autumn Kitchen. We'll mist the counter again with just a little bit of water. Careful not to add too much. Scrape the dough around the sides of the bowl and then tip out the dough upside down. Use that pre-wetted dough scraper to help release the edges off the counter. Lift and gently pull the dough outwards from the center. Use wet hands to do this and work delicately and slowly. Try not to pull from the edges, pull instead from the center out. You do not want to pull so fast that the dough tears. This is a great method to introduce a lot of extra strength into your dough early on you'll end up forming a rectangular shape. Now the idea is to pick up one edge of the dough and fold into the center, being sure to eliminate any large air pockets. Then fold the other side into the center. Finish by pulling the top down halfway and then the bottom up over the top. Next, move your dough to a fresh bulking dish. I like to use a small Pyrex dish with low sides. Cover and let rest for 45 minutes. The next stage is strengthening of the dough via stretch and folds. The number and frequency of these folds is going to be dependent on the length of bulk as well as your dough extensibility and how the dough develops over the course of the bulk. For a dough like this one, I like to do three of them at 45 minute intervals. It's now been 45 minutes since the lamination of the dough. Notice how the dough has relaxed and now covers the bottom of the dish. This dough is nice and extensible, but we must build up some strength. With wet hands, reach under the dough, pull the dough up slowly and evenly, detaching the dough on the side farther away from you. The dough will naturally wrap itself under. You may need to pull the dough again to fully detach from the top, that's fine. Once finished, perform the same coil fold again on the other side. Continue the coil folds on the sides of the dough as well. Be sure as you go to pop any large air pockets you encounter. These are not signs of fermentation. They're pockets introduced during mixing, as well as in the lamination. What a difference a fold makes. Notice how strong the dough appears after giving a coil fold. It's holding its new shape nicely. Check the dough temperature. Mark the temperature in your notes. We're going to cover and let rest 45 minutes. What is important is that you're closely watching your dough, giving it what it needs. So go ahead and check the temperature again. My bulk is usually around 75 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll go ahead and cover and let this rest another 45 minutes. 45 minutes later, we're on to the next stretch and fold. 
You may not see any significant rise in the dough at this point. This is normal. Most of the rise I see usually occurs in the last third of the bulk. So go ahead and repeat the same coil folds again on all four sides of the dough. Continue to take notes on how each fold imparts strength to the dough. Also take note of how your dough settles after each rest following each stretch and fold. If you're noticing that your dough seems a little loose still, you may wish to add in another coil fold or even two before shaping. With a stronger dough, I'll generally fold two to three times, but with a more extensible dough, I'll sometimes perform four or more coil folds if necessary. Note the temperature, cover, and let rest another 45 minutes. Now we're on to the third, and for this dough, the final stretch and fold. You may begin to see a little bit of rise in your bulking dough at this point. Notice how the dough is not spreading out to the far corners of the bulking dish. This is good. It's a sign of strength developing. We'll go ahead and perform the coil folds. Four total, one on each side of the dough as before. As I've already mentioned, if your dough seems overly extensible, you may wish to add in an additional stretch and fold or even two. After noting the temperature, again we're sitting at about 75 degrees, we'll monitor until the end of bulk. For this dough at this temperature, about one and a half to two more hours. All right, we're gonna move forward with shaping. It has been a little over 90 minutes since the last coil fold, approximately six hours since adding the leaven, sitting at a pretty stable 74 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The dough should appear puffy and somewhat light. From the strength and structure building stretch and folds, the dough should have some roundness at the edges. And overall, it should have grown approximately 50% in volume since adding the leaven. I like to flour the countertop, and I also like to add a bit of flour to the bottom part of the dough in the dish for easy removal. Using your floured fingers to help release the dough from the top of the dish, flip over and give the dough a moment to release on its own. Use a bench scraper to tuck flour under the edges of the dough, and then go ahead and remove the excess flour from the workspace. Use the scraper to help pick up the side flap of your dough and gently pull out just a bit before folding up on top of the center of the dough. Use your hand to pat the dough down during the shaping process to try to rid of any very large pockets of air. The more you pat down, the more even your crumb will look. So do the same with the other side flap. Now lift the top of the dough and begin to roll down onto itself. I like to use my thumbs to gently but firmly tuck the dough in, creating a more taut surface on top of the dough. Once you roll fully up and get to the seam, seal the edge using your fingers. You can push the shaped dough on the counter to firm up the surface of the dough, but don't do it too much. Then you use your fingers to pinch the edges to seal. The less flour present during this step, the easier it will be to seal shut. Dust the top of your dough lightly with a brown rice flour. Brown rice flour is ideal as it really prevents any sticking to your banneton. It helps keep the surface dry and prevents the dough from getting tacky. I also like to pair with a banneton liner, but you can get away without it. Just be sure to very liberally dust your banneton if not using a liner. Use your scraper to flip over your dough so that the seam is facing up and the top of the dough is facing down. Gently lift and transfer the dough into the banneton. Go ahead and cover and we'll move on to the proofing stage. So we are on to the final proof. I almost always do a short room temperature proof, followed by a long overnight refrigerated retard. Because I push the bulk stage so far, I do not require a very long room temperature proof, usually only 10 to 20 minutes. 
Then I move to a very cold refrigerator for an overnight retard. Anything less than about 39 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit and your dough will not experience any noticeable rise. Mine is set to 38 degrees Fahrenheit. One final note. In my opinion, the colder your fridge, the better as you can sort of remove the variable from your fermentation. Just get it pretty much done before shaping for easier monitoring. If your fridge temp is warmer, you will likely see your dough rise overnight. In this case, be sure to cut your bulk stage by a bit so you do not have an issue with over fermentation or over proofing. So this particular dough I let rest in the banneton for 15 minutes at room temperature before moving to the refrigerator at 38 degrees. The next morning it is finally bake time. It has been resting in the cold fridge for 14 hours. My oven has been preheating for a little over an hour at 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Straight from the fridge, while still cold, I'll sprinkle on some semolina flour. Cover the dough with a sheet of pre-cut parchment paper and carefully flip out so that the dough is now oriented with the top up and the bottom down. We are now going to create a spot for the dough to release steam while it bakes. I use a curved blade attached to a lam and I slash the dough approximately a half inch deep and at a 45 degree angle. It's very necessary to score your dough so that you can prevent your dough from blowing out of the bottom or the sides when it hits the hot heat of the oven. There are many different ways to bake bread in a home oven, the most popular being through the use of a Dutch oven. I have another YouTube video on how to bake using a Dutch oven and I'll post the link to that video in the description below. But here I wanted to show you my regular baking setup using my gas oven. This setup is reminiscent of the setup used by Northwest Sourdough, using a baking stone and a roaster lid cover. I also use a broiler tray at the bottom of the oven filled with lava racks to create even more steam. This steam enters in under the roaster lid, which has been slightly offset to allow a space for the steam to enter. After the hour preheat at 500 degrees Fahrenheit, my oven is nice and hot now. I carefully remove the roaster lid while wearing heat safety gloves and slide in the dough on the parchment paper. If I'm only baking one loaf at a time, there's usually enough room to add a few ice cubes next to my dough to create an even more steamy environment. Replace the lid with the offset positioned over the lava racks and pour on a cup of water just before closing the oven door. After 20 minutes at 500 degrees Fahrenheit, open the oven door, remove the roaster lid. This is always the best part of the process. Look at that oven spring. Very happy with this bake. Return the halfway baked bread to the oven, close the door, and lower the temperature to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Continue baking about 20 minutes more. Now let's take it out of the oven and see this loaf of bread in some natural sunlight. I think this looks great. Evenly shaped, nice spring, lovely ear. I like the color, deeply caramelized. The smell is fantastic. I'll let this cool for an hour or ideally two and then slice it up. Definitely happy with the overall shape and open light crumb on this one. The ferment seems to have gone well. The openness goes all the way through. It looks delicious, smells wonderful. There's a nice thin crackly crust with a soft chewy creamy crumb. This type of bread is really nice for dipping in an infused oil or soup or for smothering with butter, which is what I'm planning to do. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. Please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and check out my Instagram page at Foolproof Baking.